Cool. All right. Well, welcome all. Thanks so much for coming to the uh, third PL Andres All Hands meeting of 2022. My name is Steve Lepke. I'm one of the engineering managers here on the team. Your agenda for today, we're going to, per usual, do some team updates and also spotlight on some projects. And then we'll have a focused time at the end to do a deeper dive, particularly around some of our infra projects. Reminder for setting context, uh, you know, PL Andres Group is part of the larger Protocol Labs network whose you know, mission is to drive breakthroughs in computing technology and push humanity forward. Specifically, the PL Andres group itself is heavily involved with projects you're likely familiar with, like IPFS, LibP2P, Filecoin, IPLD, and, and others. And uh, you know, the mission for our, our group is to scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Filecoin, and LibP2P by onboarding the best developers and contributors in the world, driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, and then scaling network native research and development across the across the network. So how we do this, you know, this is uh, taking this is handled currently by about twelve different teams um, taking on different areas here. I think last all hands we shared about our public Notion page, so you can click in and read more about these groups. But these are the teams that are responsible for pushing, uh, you know, on on that mission. Uh, you know, we're currently about 95 amazing, strong individuals, but uh, we need to bring in more across all, all kinds of different roles, engineering management, software engineers, TPMs, PMs, infra research, data scientists, like there's lots of openings, particularly for NGRES, but also in the wider network as a whole. So if, if you know of anyone or you're interested yourself, feel free to, uh, you know, apply. Um, again, lo lots of opportunities and we need more great folks to help make it happen. Uh, specifically, our strategy, again, related to what I just was talking about, is to grow a wide and robust talent funnel. Um, so both in terms of people coming in, but also making sure that the knowledge that has been developing within Protocol Labs over the, the last number of years is getting outwards and is being shared. So that's, that's part one in the talent funnel. Um, key to all of this is having robust storage and retrieval. We want to be able to get large data in, but also to be able to get it uh, out. Uh, so that that's that's critical. You know, we we spotlighted uh, last all hands about the FBM effort, which is one of our concerted um, you know pushes for breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute. But there's other great stuff happening there as well regarding retrieval markets. You know, increasing the scalability of consensus uh, compute over data, etc. And kind of underpinning all of this is that we keep our critical network operations running. So you know, the releases. Uh, of, of so the libraries, keeping the infra um, for the networks secure and, and running as well. Like all of the th items of keeping the lights on are a key for the other efforts and to enable others in the ecosystem to, to build on top. So that's, that's the strategy. And uh, with, with that, we'll now um, jump into IPFS. Take us away, Adin. All right. Hey everybody, uh, we'll talk about some of the recent updates on IPFS uh, and how it is that we are progressing on making peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking uh, and retrieving data easier. Um, so some of the metrics that we're tracking, number of peer-to-peer -peer nodes on the network and how long it takes to uh, find uh, newly added content. Um, things are still sort of progressing, uh, progressing pretty well. Um, a new one, that, a new metric we've added here is around sort of uh, how we're managing uh, on the Go side at least and, and uh, graphical interfaces with PRs um, and issues. Um, we have gotten better uh, recently at uh, you know, closing more issues. Um, we've been doing and, and making our way through those. Uh, there's still a, a bunch left to do. Um, uh, so if you, if you see some slowdowns, you sort of know uh, what our backlog is looking at. But uh, it's, it's shrinking, which is good. So this month, there have, we've made some releases, um, some security releases for Go IPFS, um, bug fixes for IPFS desktop, things like uh, keeping the uh, Ukrainian uh, Russian uh, Wikipedia snapshots uh, pinned and updated, various uh, spec PRs uh, to make things better and interact with our, our community and improve our protocols. Thankfully, uh, Steve's made an awesome uh, project board so that uh, both people working on the team and externally can see uh, what we're up to and what's the top of our priority list. Uh, coming up, uh, GoFS 013, uh, we're embedding uh, libp2p resource management. Uh, and making our gateways better at serving things like car files uh, and so they can be implemented verifiably. Um, and we're going to better interact with the, uh, our community on helping them understand different types of IPFS implementations that are out there uh, and set up some meetings uh, around those new implementations. Thanks, Adin. 
So Lib2P modular networking stack for peer-to-peer -peer protocols, uh, powering all kinds of different networks. Yeah, okay. So we're monitoring all these uh, many networks already. How, how is Lib2P interacting over there? How are the many different implementations working? So if you want to explore that data in general, on the bottom right is a link to um, a lot of the data we collect. Cool. So one big work item on the LibPDB Steward side is uh, hole punching, or aka um, Project Flare. Um, for that to work in a decentralized fashion, we want uh, all IPFS public nodes to act as relay nodes and thus facilitate hole punching for those clients behind nets. For that to work for the many clients out there, we actually need a lot of relays or public nodes on the IPFS network. So this is a really important metric uh, worth growing in the long term, uh, but probably high enough for now for us to actually move forward in general around Project Flare. Um, so lip to be highlights. Uh, from the community side, we're planning to attend uh, P2P Paris uh, a conference end of April. So it would be really cool to see many folks of, over there. And then uh, actually this month in Berlin, we went to the ResNet Lab meetup uh, organized by Janis, uh, which was really cool as uh, it's always good to have engineers and research in the same room. All right, so big effort, as I said, hole punching, uh, aka Project Flare. Um, the missing piece on the Go side right now is um, for clients to discover um, public relays out there and thus listen via those relays and thus facilitate the hole punches. And um, today that is called auto relay, but there's still a couple of missing pieces there. Then uh, we want to make sure we don't regress in the going through forward. So we need more automated testing around all of this. And then we have a really cool collaboration with Dennis Trautwein from ResNet Lab, who's helping us to measure success rates on hole punching. This is very similar to Project Flare phase one. You might remember that binary running on your laptop back then. Um, and yeah, that will help tremendously. Um, GoLibPDB v018 with Research Manager is shipped. So that um, is required for IPFS, what is it, 013. And then the, the greatest news, I think, for our team, um, we have three software engineers uh, joining the LibPDB team. That is huge and I'm really, really excited for that. All right, and I think Steve, you're doing yeah, the right side. I, I, I know we're kind of cool. over time. The key thing, just want to say, is like test ground is moving forward. You can find us on uh, IPFS Discord, where all the action is happening. So we're really excited about that. You know, Alex gave a great update last time about the investments he's been doing in JS Lib P2P to get it ready with TypeScript. So that's in its final stages. Um, and you know, there's been some important security fixes, etc., that have been going on there. But that's all been publicly disclosed. Uh, you know, good stuff happening in Lib P2P. Thanks, Max. We'll move on to, uh, to IPLD. Take it away, Eric. Hello, hello. So for everybody who needs a reminder, IPLD is the way we are trying to make a data model for the decentralized web and libraries and software to help everyone build better stuff faster. We have a couple of updates for you. Thank you. We have a new release out of the Go IPLD Prime Libraries, 16.0. This should be a super easy upgrade. So if you use this library, please do go ahead and bump the number. We've got lots of new stuff, lots of stuff fixed, lots of stuff a little bit easier to use, and it should be completely without breaking changes to the API because we've started to prioritize that very highly. One of the coolest things, there are many, but one of the coolest things is we now have an interface for big bytes, which can be used by advanced data layouts. And this will let you work with large blobs of binary data without necessarily immediately loading the full thing into memory. This is gonna unlock a ton of features in the future. Some of the other things that are already advancing hand in hand with this is selectors can signal to invoke an ADL. An ADL might be, for example, Unix FS V1, and we have plugin code for that now. And another new feature has come along, such as a range clause in the selector system, which can ask for a range of bytes within a larger object. This is wild because it gives us an end to end feature where you can ask for parts of a large hunk of data and have uh, somebody stream you back the Merkle proof of what happened inside the process of getting there. And you can have this conversation without needing to understand any of the sharding functions or anything that happened on the inside. This is incredible. This has been years of planning. Thanks a lot to Will Scott and the team around him for shipping some of these features recently. We've also got some new patch specs. These are things that you can review but are pretty early and have not landed yet. We are, of course, hiring. I'm talking too fast and running out of time. 
Um, there's also some new exploration reports on the horizon about a lenses concept, which could uh, further advance this signaling system and make it more extensible. If anyone can take a look at that, feedback is highly welcome. Lots of other news that I just don't have time for. See you around. Thanks, Eric. Alcoin, take us away. Hello, everyone. Um, reporting live from the, uh, Jennifer's apartment. Uh, all right, Filecoin. Uh, we can we have some metrics to start with, I think. Um, let me get to the next step. Perfect. So, total network storage capacity is up to just under sixteen megabytes. This is up from fifteen and a half the last time we spoke, I think. So, another half megabyte in a couple of weeks. Uh, total number of deals is up to two point four five, up from about two million million, up from up from about two million the last time. Data stored is increased by about uh, fifteen petabytes uh, from the last time we spoke. Uh, up to 56.6 petabytes, 37 of which is verified. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the amount of verified data on Filecoin is, is, uh, is increasing very, very quickly. Um, and we now have uh, 49 million NFTs stored on Filecoin as well. That's 151 terabytes of data. Um, highlights. So the last time we spoke, Snap Deals, which was Network V15, was kind of the big exciting thing. In the time since then, we have we've had over 750 uh, proof replica update messages. So a lot of data is being introduced through this new uh, the new path that was introduced through there. Uh, in the time since then, uh, FVM is increasingly becoming the focus of the various teams working on Filecoin, both within Entrez and outside of it. Uh, the exciting update to share is that all major implementations can now sync mainnet using the FBM. Uh, and as of this morning, the Venus team, uh, the folks at IPFS Force, announced that they have been sealing new data, proving it, and winning blocks all using the FBM, which is very exciting. They totally beat us and the Lotus folks to it, uh, but we're very happy about that. Um, Rust-based actors are being tested and audited for NV16 as well, uh, and a bunch of last uh, few details are being finalized for the V16 upgrade. Um, coming up, uh, we're scoping and implementing the last few uh, issues for V16. Um, post workers, which is a something that's really been demanded and initially was implemented by the community, is almost ready uh, for review, ready to be used. Uh, so it's going through its initial testing phase. Um, the folks over at Bedrock are getting ready to test and ship their boosted indexer work. Uh, and Philproofs is continuing to work on Heal 2. Uh, right now, it's still within Philproofs, but it'll probably be coming to uh, be ready for integration and to go live uh, kind of sometime in the Q2 timeline is what's expected there. Lots happening as always. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to move forward into team updates. First up is NetOps. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Jesse. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing this kind of presentation. Thank you for putting everything together. <laughs> uh, so NetOps, we have uh, several very key API in there. Uh, first is our 95 percentile for the first tie to, tie to first byte. Uh, we are training down for the, to the nine second. Uh, it's grow, it was, uh, I remember the 30 second like one month ago. Uh, that's a huge improvement from our point of view. So uh, we can move forward, have a better performance. Um, for the people who upload and ping the data into our uh, NFT cluster and the West 3 cluster, you can see the number growing around like less than 10%, I would say, maybe 5%, but that's a lot. Uh, we are going to moving a uh, pretty good amount of number and data coming in. So uh, the red request, uh, we are increased for 853 million. And the gateway usage a week is a 4.1 million. Also, you can see our network uptime is uh, only one. We kind of see uh, down, down once is an IPFS uh, IO gateway. It down like uh, we did the mid the five nine, only three nine in there. So everything looks pretty good. Uh, but I, what we use in this KBI, so come here. We, we we are not trying to show in people say we are great. Every all the traffic coming us. We do want to see the traffic growing. But what we want to more see is more adoption. So more people running their own cluster and IPFS and uh, Firecoin cluster. So we are hoping we can see less requests coming in, but the whole network getting more rich. Uh, that will relate to our next page, the thing we are working on. Yeah. So now also we have several updates. Um, first, because we want to build this kind of a best practice for running the IPFS or Firecoin infrastructure, we are working with the vendor who have a lot of experience working on the enterprise standard to working with us so we can learn from them to what we should do. Second, we want to increase adoption. People can use our IPFS or, uh, or Filecoin. So we also spend the effort 
to running this kind of a Lotus build artificial pipeline to make sure we can create a different build easily so people can use our um, Filecoin to run their Filecoin on their own thing. Uh, third thing is our internal. Uh, we have a really running inside our da um, data center. Um, it's part of a lo Lotus, but we want to make sure when we represent out all the data and how we run the data center is uh, world class. So uh, we are working on the refractor to make sure that it can be scale easily scale, more stable, and have a better performance. Um, fourth thing is uh, more on the operation size. Um, we are work if people want to join our network, they need to start have a snapshot. We never have a right process in place to make sure people can have the snapshot easily and start in joining the network. So we are working on how to make sure this is more easier. Uh, yeah, the, for, the first thing not the last is hiring. Okay, yeah, we need a lot of people coming to help. Come to help us. <laughs> you, you know anyone is good. Share the resume with me, with the seat, and we will work in from there to make the team better and stronger. So um, I think that this is the first time i doing with uh, all hands. I want to say that in everybody, right? Uh, I know a, a lot of people in the team, we, we are working very hard under the thing. No one is, if nothing going wrong, people didn't notice. The infrastructure key. <laughs> if something going wrong, it's just infrastructure looking very bad. So um, that's why we will try to also have some of the team introduction after this slide, I think in the end. So everything can come in, our team members are coming to tell people what we are working on, why we are on that. On that. I think we are totally aligned with the um, uh, protocol lab scope. We want to make sure the adoption for the IPFS and Firecoin. Um, increase in the world. We want to serve in the world in a better place so people can have the P2P network for file storage. Um, um, go ahead. So Jesse, just one more thing maybe we should add is uh, we actually have uh, uh, just signed up for the Git, uh, Kubernetes GitOps uh, 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 contract to actually build out uh, a fully automated uh, and, yeah. and, and next generation uh, uh, GitOps based uh, platform. So yeah. that has been, that's uh, looking forward to that one uh, yeah. and helping out the different teams, yeah. not just NetOps, but all the other, uh, many other teams as well across PL who can benefit from this. Updates from the Nitro front. Uh, so NFT.storage is closing in on 50 million uploads. We have some announcements uh, getting ready, working with um, an agency, uh, like a professional PR agency uh, to get this pushed in a lot of mainstream press and would appreciate everyone's help in amplifying this when it comes. Uh, I think these announcements will be queued up for Monday. The The threshold will probably be crossed over the weekend. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're uh, seeing a kind of continued exponential growth on the NFT store side. Uh, for a while, it was kind of like linear on a larger base, but um, some more efforts, uh, recent efforts like like integration with Metaplex and Solana have really kind of bolstered the numbers recently. On the Web3 storage side, uh, continued steady growth. Um, one thing that isn't called out here is the number of active users continues to increase on the Web3 storage side. And we're excited about being able to, uh, to give that a little bit more love as time goes on and things get short up on the NFT storage side. Highlights, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the shipped slides, but um, a bunch of stuff has been shipped in the last few weeks from the NFT storage gateway to you can delegated uploads to a big redesign of web3.storage. So excited to tell you more about that in a little bit. Uh, heads up to everyone. If you see like Notion docs with warning labels on the top uh, for Nitro things saying that we this like doc has moved or deprecated, it's because we're midway through a Notion migration um, into our own uh, Notion workspace. Uh, that along with other nucleation prep is happening in the background. So just ping me if you need access to things. Um, and yeah, uh, we gave a few talks actually at South by Southwest, including for the main event and um, looking forward for those recordings to be up and we'll definitely share with the group once those are de there. Um, and then, yeah, really quickly, one thing to call out on things moving forward, uh, we're pushing forward a big work stream around improving the uploads, we're pushing forward a lot of um, improvements to our uploads workflow. Right now, uh, users have to generate car files in memory on the client side and uh, send piece by piece uh, that car file up to the service. Um, we're kind of like rethinking this to be like more streaming like and resilient and uh, be able to make it easy for users to upload large files. Um, if they have a bad connection, it's no problem, that sort of thing. So um, that's going to be a multi week effort, but it brings together a lot of cool things the team has been working on. So we are looking 
forward to the results of that, and we'll definitely share uh, more about that as it, it becomes fleshed out. Hi, all. Uh, an update from Bedrock team. Uh, starting boost rollout next week with the SPX uh, group and uh, on track for full launch end of April. Uh, Index of project is uh, onboarding dot storage collections at the moment. Um, we are on track to be part of Lotus 1.50.1 release and engaging uh, additional index providers such as Pinata, Ken Labs, and others. Uh, Repsys has delivered a demo and initial integration with Fieldbot and Tando, and we're starting to integrate with Phil Rep. And Lightning work is wrapping up uh, with the next release. Um, uh, the updates include graph sync uh, improvements and data, uh, data transfer stability improvements. Uh, exciting highlights, we've indexed over 1 billion CIDs, uh, added the improvements such as multi-protocol support and rate limiting. Um, the team has posted eight grants on DGM, attracted uh, about 20 uh, super solid community applications and submissions. Um, the areas covered with these grants range from large quant tooling to full plus rod analysis. Please, please refer uh, your contacts to apply for these grants if they haven't yet. Uh, our KPIs are under construction. We're investigating some of the deal bot issues uh, uh, from last week. In general, we're um, expanding, um, we're working on expanding deal success metrics across additional data sources, uh, hoping to use auto retrieve to get network wide retrieval metrics and also looking to create a more scalable solutions that can serve more targeted uh, metrics needs, such as data programs. Um, uh, in, in terms of opportunities, um, first, in, on the retrieval incentives, we're consolidating work across multiple uh, teams uh, across the company to make sure we're all aligned in what we're building. And also, we're rolling out our new storage provider community engagement program uh, for new releases, with Boost and Indexer releases being the first one to be tested out. Thanks, Bedrox. ResDev. I can jump in with my terrible voice, but I think the biggest uh, data point here is that there's a Compute Over Data Summit in Paris, April 3rd through 5th. So um, there's a lot of exciting roadmap updates uh, leading up to that. And then there's going to be a, a great report after fact. So see many of you in Paris in a couple weeks. Over to you, Patrick. So yeah, retrieval markets, a roadmap update. Um, the Saturn team have been working hard and we're getting the first Saturn gateways deployed this week. Um, there's a new retrieval.market website going up very soon uh, with just kind of flashy new designs and just a bit more ability to add new projects and just discover what's going on in this space. Um, Myel have completed the JS GraphSync grant, uh, and they're also working hard on Rust GraphSync for those who are interested in different variants of GraphSync. Um, and there's also been a, a grant kicked off with Leeway Hertz for a retrieval performance dashboard which will essentially compare all of the different Web3 CDNs uh, and just, yeah, across the world, making requests from different parts of the world um, and finding out where they're performing. Uh, in April, Saturn will start launching some stations, uh, maybe just privately to start off with before going public. We've got a WebRTC Direct grant kicking off with Chainsafe um, and the Titan Ultra Network, which is another uh, uh, Web3 or content address CDN, um, they're completing their phase one research, and that's with New Web Group. In May, the Saturn is going to, we hope, uh, have its v V0 launch. And we, we also come to the end of the Magmo grant for multi-hop payment channels. And I'm sure that will continue into some more work. Uh, and in the second half this year, um, the FCR proxy payment network, which has been sort of a follow-on project from the Pegasus work last year, will complete and will also be trying to tackle some of the crypto economic issues around retrieval. Uh, some highlights KPIs, the team's grown. We're now working with like four, soon to be five people, um, most of whom are working on the Saturn initiative. And there, as everyone else has said, there's positions open. There's also positions open in retrieval markets. We're going to have a team colo in Barcelona between April the 25th to 29th, the week after the Amsterdam DevConnect. So let me know if um, anyone would like to come and join. And yeah, we've launched some Saturn gateways and we've got 10 grants going with the Retrieval Market Working Group. Um, challenges or opportunities, I'll let everyone decide which, which bucket it falls into, but there's so many CDNs now for content address data um, and the list just keeps growing. Uh, so it's just going to be interesting to see how these can work together and find slightly different 
spaces in the, the grand Web3 map. Um, and then there's also just the crypto economic ch challenges of the retrieval network um, are very interesting and very challenging. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you, Patrick. Into some of our uh, spotlights. FEM. As Ayush mentioned earlier, um, that now Lotus can also sync mainnet, uh, Filecoin mainnet, uh, with FEM using built-in actor, which is super exciting. We are the 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 node is now launching a Lotus V one fifty one like RC. We're getting it tested with uh, some of our TSEs. Uh, so that's that. Yes, uh, Venus and Four seems to be beating us. You know, they are also on mainnet. They're very exciting. Uh, so, you know, first step towards FBM. Slingshot. Hey, everybody. Um, we launched a new program within the Slingshot umbrella yesterday, actually, called Slingshot Evergreen. For those of you that have been following, Slingshot has been on a nice long journey or since mainnet of onboarding loads and loads of data to the network. I think we just at about 35 petabytes now in terms of data onboarded of about 61, I believe, public and open data sets uh, across the board. But of course, 15 months also means some of the initial deals have started to expire and we want to ensure that data isn't lost so that we can reliably host mirrors of those data sets on the network uh, into the long term. So Evergreen is effectively like a mechanism or, or a long term program that watches for data that is in deals that are expiring in the next two months and puts them up uh, for effectively like renewal. Uh, and so storage providers can sign up, get vetted and then identify specific PCIDs that they're interested in storing in verified deals for the next year and a half. Uh, and we will uh, automate like deal proposals for them. Uh, you should check out the program details, our super swanky website. Uh, and like, really want to thank the team for a lot of hard work over the last week to get this out the door. Nailed the timer. Good stuff. All right. NFT Storage Gateway. Hello. It's Alan's lucky day. Get to see my face again. Uh, we launched a uh, an NFT Storage Gateway. It's a little bit misleading if you come from the world of IPFS gateways, where it's actually a gateway racer. Uh, folks send HTTP requests to the NFT storage gateway, NFT storage that link. Um, and then we race multiple public gateways by sending requests to them. Uh, and then the first one to get back to us with the data, uh, we serve it up to the client. Uh, it does come with very aggressive CDN caching, uh, cloud worker, it's built on cloud workers running on the edge. Uh, so we do get to take advantage of a lot of, you know, the the awesome caching infrastructure out there. We actually have had a 70% plus cache hit rate so far for content requested um, on the NFT storage gateway, um, uh, just really specializing and doubling down on NFT storage C or NFT CIDs. Um, and there's been about 30 million requests in the last seven days. So a lot of folks have already started using it. Uh, there are upgrades coming soon, a paid perma cache, super hot gateway, uh, Contrary to what you might believe, I did not make this. It was uh, Vasco with the help of NetOps and really appreciate the hard work there. Another thing we shipped, I mentioned earlier, uh, you can delegate it uploads. Uh, Hugo was the real driver here. Um, there's a problem in NFT storage previously where we would issue API tokens, but we uh, our users couldn't put those API tokens in their end users' browsers. Um, and as a result, would have to put up a proxy server to kind of be a, an intermediate touch point to upload data to NFT storage. Uh, but now you can do it without uh, this proxy server because of UCANs. Uh, there are JWTs um, where you uh, can have a chain of signatures uh, signed with folks as DIDs to grant uh, subsets of permissions to uh, subsequent uh, UCAN tokens. So uh, a user can get a UCAN token uh, authorizing them to upload data on the marketplace's behalf directly to nft.storage. Um, and, you know, it's coming in Web3 storage soon. It's going to be super valuable there as well. Uh, we're spinning out a general UCAN microservice uh, to kind of combine all this into one, one thing, as well as use it in our new uploads flow I was talking about earlier. Um, so super excited about that. Uh, please test it out if this sounds interesting to you. And finally, there was a big Web3 storage redesign, and it is real drippy. It's nice looking. Please check it out. Uh, Agency Undone did this for us. Um, just, yeah, I mean, not a whole bunch to say other than it looks completely different than uh, super sleek. I'm the boost here. Hello, Boost. Yeah, it's coming. It's so close. Um, so we're kicking off testing with SPs next week, which is very, very exciting. Um, and we're on track for a full release in April. Uh, we're wrapping up 
right now updates to Estuary and Fill Client so that when Boost launches, they'll be able to take advantage of it right away. We're also working with Textile um, to get support into Auctioneer and BidBot. So all those offline deals will no longer need to be offline. It's going to be great. Um, so, and what is Boost? Well, here's a couple of feature highlights. So Boost is the new version of Markets for Lotus. It's fully backwards compatible with the current version of Lotus. It's also standalone. So Lotus can release on its own and Boost can release on its own. It's really, really great. They only depend on the, the Lotus API, which is awesome. We're also launching with support for storage over HTTP. So all those car files you have on S3, guess what? You can just make deals with them directly. Uh, we're also launching with a lightweight CLI client for data preparation and storage. So if you ever thought like deal making on Lotus or deal making on Filecoin was too hard, it's going to get easier so soon. Um, we're also launching with a web UI for storage providers. And you can check out a bunch of the in-progress docs at boost.filecoin.io. Thanks. All right. Uh, so just a quick update from the FEM Already Builders program. This has been great work from Ali and Dragon uh, happening here. Uh, we had over 100 applications out of which we accepted 25 teams and individuals. And last week we had an informal meet and greet call. Uh, 45 folks from many groups uh, joined, including people from Valis and Men's Dow, Polyphene, Phil Swan, uh, all of those groups that are listed on the left. And we basically went around the room and introduced ourselves. And um, it felt like um, there was great energy, enthusiasm, and it felt like the start of something big. Um, lots of cool builders all around the world. And each team spoke to uh, spoke about what they're aspiring to build on top of the FEM. Uh, and some of the great ideas there were things around reputation systems, cross-chain bridges and L2s, new SDKs, indexing services, uh, a, a bunch of things there, uh, pretty pretty cool stuff. And last but not least, uh, Ali and Dragon also worked on spinning up a Notion website for the program. So there's a link in the slide, go into the slide and check it out. And Ali is also putting together a public directory of all the teams that are participating and what everybody's working on so that you can uh, spy on the progress there and like stay, uh, stay updated with everything that's happening in, inside the program. So make sure to check it out once it's out. All right, DRAN is in space. Uh, we have been collaborating with uh, CryptoSat for a while uh, since last last year, September last year, and finally the experiment went live and it was successful. They actually ran an instance of DRAN between a node uh, on, in the ISS and on the ground station, and they intend to roll this out to multiple satellites uh, in the future. And essentially, this is going to become a new frontier for more trusted tamper-proof computation, so to speak. So DRAN is one of the first early set of protocols that are going to be onboarded into space, and uh, we are looking forward to working with them further. So stay tuned. Uh, we actually grew our, um, our, our uh, ecosystem collaborations as well. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a uh, ETH Global's BuildQuest Summit on Web3 Gaming, uh, and we gave a talk on DRAN, and uh, a lot of folks excited, got, got a few few responses on Twitter as well. So, you know, uh, just uh, kind of building up on the ecosystem collaborations going forwards. We also grew the League of Entropy, the collection of uh, of the partners that actually operate the DRAN network as a decentralized network. Store Swift joined us as a 15th member, and we have a couple of new, new members uh, lined up as well, including uh, CryptoSat as well. Um, and of course, we completed the development of new DRAN features, uh, so, which is quite groundbreaking in sense. Uh, one of the first few randomness beacons, which will be unchained, uh, and will actually also be enable us to run multiple variable frequency uh, uh, networks, which means we can run the 30 second network. And in addition to that, we can also run lower frequency networks as needed for, for supporting uh, additional use cases. So testing is going to commence next month and we intend to file a Filecoin FIP uh, and engage with the Filecoin team to understand how best we, they can actually make use of the new features that we are actually launching. Timeline is not a concern. It's more about uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we find the right um, uh, integration for, with, with Filecoin in the future that can make use of the new features. And of course, we are kicking off a number of uh, uh, LOE, League of Entropy focused projects that are going to make life easier for this 15 odd independent organizations to kind of operate DRAN. Thanks to thanks to Yanis, uh, uh, Nicola, Yolan, Mario, Will, uh, uh, Hector, I think it's, it's, been, it's been an amazing uh, push that we have been giving here and uh, looking forward to uh, we're taking DRAN to the next level and, and growing the LOE as well. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, it's Yanis here. Uh, I'm coming to report uh, after a great meeting that we had in Berlin with ResNet Lab and our uh, collaborators. We gathered everyone for the second time 
uh, in like physically in Berlin, and we had uh, great updates from all the teams. We lots we had lots of what they're doing. There was lots of enthusiasm, lots of breakout sessions, and lots of results. Uh, there was many lip B2B and IPFS students that joined. So thank you for joining. It's a great way to start working closer together. Uh, the primary topic was on network measurements and benchmarking and protocol optimization. I gave a demo in the uh, NGOS demo day on the 10th of March. So watch that recording. Uh, we've produced a 14-page report with all of the latest results. And there are links here to find out the, um, uh, the outcomes of the meeting, which uh, to go in a little bit more detail are um, a list of items that we want to dive deep into. Uh, this includes the flare uh, nut hole punching that uh, Max and others mentioned previously. Uh, we want to see better, you know, how the effectiveness and the performance of protocols like BitSwap. We want to identify if um, there are peers with rotating peer IDs in the network, which might be uh, screwing up some of the uh, content routing um, processes, uh, unresponsive DHT server nodes, the uh, reliability and effectiveness of Hydra nodes, and so on, and eventually build what we have a vision for the IPFS network observatory, where um, one will is going to be able to look into the network from multiple different perspectives and be able to uh, identify, you know, uh, problems and uh, what where there is space for improvement. Uh, this is the GitHub repository that we're going to be using. There are already several uh, RFMs requests for measurements. So if you're interested, just uh, follow that repository. And out of that, um, it, it became clear that we need to have a dedicated team that is going to be working on protocol benchmarking and op optimization. And we call that uh, the probe lab. It is still in um, formation and it's going to be, it's going to leave in within production engineering, which is a new group that is going to uh, be announced very soon. So stay, stay tuned. Uh, there is going to be lots of collaborations with uh, IPFS and lipid p students. Again, as was said uh, previously, um, we have a notion page where we explain and we have pointers about everything we're working on. Uh, the first order targets is uh, the nut hole bunching success rate measurement, uh, optimistic provide and several network measurements for the IPFS um, observatory. The main motto here is that, you know, we're not measuring networks just for the sake. It's not, this is not an end, but what we want to do out of this is identify bottlenecks, find bugs, uh, quantify the available space for improvement and eventually have protocol optimizations. We are going to have um, grants for that, milestone grants. So uh, get ready, spread the word. Uh, and follow us to see, you know, um, interesting things. We have already some results on nut hole punching. You can see a uh, snapshot of a Grafana dashboard down uh, on the right-hand side, but there is much more to come. Thank you. Thanks, Yanis. Exciting stuff from ResNet Lab. Very cool. So we get to do the NetOps deep dive. Yeah, from a very high level, um, NetOps, uh, especially in the backend side, we have uh, uh, three different areas, Backforce, File, Infra, and Sentinel. Uh, from the high level, the picture is like, like this. Uh, I will have a mirror doc to can share if you're interested. Um, the team will go through and into into that uh, what they are doing and the team member and what we are today. Um, so for here, I just um, become the one to start this, this conversation. But all the hard work, all the thing happen is uh, missing the team. What is Bifrost? What does the Bifrost team do? Uh, it does a few things. Uh, mainly runs IPFS uh, infrastructure uh, at scale. Uh, our biggest project is the IPFS gateway, hosted at uh, IPFS.io and dweb.link, which allows browsers uh, that speak, well, and tools that speak HTTP to access content from the IPFS network without having to run their own nodes. It basically provides a, a canonical way to uh, address AP IPFS content uh, via uh, HTTP. We also provide the default bootstrap nodes, which are baked into GoIPFS and, and JSIPFS as a public service so that uh, other nodes can find each other in the network. And we also uh, run preload nodes, which augment uh, JSIPFS and expose uh, IPFS uh, endpoints that are not available in, in, in the browser. Uh, it, in practice, that means that uh, JS IPFS clients can add content locally in the browser, then use a uh, preload node to request that CAD, effectively caching the data and allowing the browser tab to be closed and be loaded without 
losing the data. All right, so why are we doing it? Uh, our motivation is to provide the best performance uh, infrastructure for uh, others to use, definitely, and, and mo most importantly for the IPFS gateway, which seems to be the, the most widely used infrastructure. Uh, provide best practices and uh, standards and tools for others who uh, want to run uh, IPFS and IPFS cluster at scale. How are we doing it? Uh, the high level of how the gateway is run is we have uh, bare metal nodes uh, they're run on Equinix. Uh, we run in seven data centers and we have between four to 16 uh, nodes. The reason we run on bare metal and not VMs is because IO, disk IO is very important and access times are very important if we want to provide uh, very good, uh, very, very fast service. So that's why we haven't, we haven't moved on to uh, VMs yet where most uh, storage is, is via uh, network, basically. Uh, we're, we're working towards that too. Uh, there is a load balancing layer uh, that's running Nginx and does all of the HTTP uh, layer uh, balancing and, and filtering and such, and also a separate IPFS uh, layer upstream from that, which allows us to uh, scale out just like, uh, the IPFS boxes without having to mess with any uh, uh, load balancing or Nginx uh, issues. On the load balancer uh, layer, we run uh, we use Anycast. Uh, uh, to route traffic from to the two uh, addresses uh, to the, the data center that is uh, the fewest hops away from the request origin. So each load balancer node uh, announces a global uh, BGP route for the IP uh, uh, the IPv4 and IPv6 that that we run. Uh, we use uh, hundreds of metrics, if not probably thousands by this point, uh, to monitor and uh, alert. As far as uptime goes, we have pingdom checks from uh, synthetic checks from the outside of the network. Uh, within the, our network, we have uh, Nginx metrics, uh, load balancer, uh, error rates, uh, performance, time to first byte, that kind of thing. We also collect Go IPFS metrics from uh, from within IPFS. Uh, things such as uh, Go routines, peers, want lists, um, also time to first byte within Go IPFS, and uh, also OS level metrics such as IO, CPU, mem, like generic things. We follow infrastructure as code principles, which means we all everything that we uh, uh, we we run is managed in GitHub, and we deploy it through CI via Terraform and Ansible uh, playbooks. Our progress so far: uh, we've recently hit one billion requests a week on the IPFS.io gateway. Uh, it has since gone down a little bit, but it seems to be going back up. So we're hovering around a billion uh, requests, total requests. And we've hit time to first byte of around eight seconds for 95% of our users with a 99.9% uptime. And what we're going for is five seconds. So we will continue to scale and improve our system to, to ensure that for 95% of our users, it doesn't take longer than five seconds to start receiving content from the IPFS network. All right, fill in for us. So what we do, we operate and monitor core file-following network infrastructure, uh, bootstrap nodes, API, chain.love, dash dashboard, disputers, and we're also a core part of running the DevNet, such as calibration net, butterfly net, and interop net. Uh, we drive operational improvements in tooling in Lotus and uh, support and enable network developers and operators. Our top goals for 2022 uh, the first one is around api.chain.love, which is a Lotus gateway. Um, this is a service that I'm sure many of you have possibly used. Uh, it's the, the, the um, default in Lotus Lite, and Lotus Lite is often used as the introduction to Filecoin. So many new, new users, uh, they, they interact with the Filecoin chain through uh, chain.love, and it, it, it allows you to interact with, it, with the chain without running a full uh, Lotus node or a data store. Um, so we have some very a ambitious goals here. We're trying to push it to be able to handle um, more than 200 requests per, per second without having uh, latency in the chain syncing. And we're uh, really looking to push Lotus to push Lotus to its limits and uh, develop tooling and, and, and improvements in Lotus to reach our goals because it will be very difficult, I think, uh, with with the with the existing patterns to get to our goals here, um, we are also 
have a goal to run a Lotus chain backup service that produces backups that are never older than eight hours. Uh, Reba has done a, a amazing job since Filecoin launch of, of running this, and we're hoping to uh, launch a, a parallel service so he can sunset his and move on to other things. Um, and we are, in, in general, trying to reduce the operational overhead for uh, Phil Infra so we can focus on high impact projects um, and not get bogged down in some of the manual toil that we have in the past. So how are we doing it? Um, we are monitoring for high uptime and collecting data for continuous per performance tuning. Um, we're automating and improving the deployment of our Lotus Core Infra and, and reducing manual toil for our, our team and um, creating and sharing operational tools and re resources. Um, and we're also supporting a lot of uh, a, a lot of devs. We are providing access to storage provider hardware and storage um, for five teams in our data center. And uh, we're leading a managed GitOps platform rollout, which is what Sid had mentioned, which is uh, Weave. And uh, Weave will, will give the, the ability for um, Android teams to have uh, autonomous control over their applications and network deployment capabilities. So uh, we're rolling that out within the next month or so. Um, and we will give you more updates on, on milestones as we start to work with Weave. So this is a basic um, diagram and it's showing um, we are running our current core infra in, in EKS. Uh, so we, we run Lotus and the gateway and the stats dashboards there. Um, and that's, that's where we're, we're focusing some, some of our work around deployments and, and automation. Uh, we, we collect data in, in Prometheus uh, visualize it in Grafana, and then we also uh, monitor that, that data and page and uh, send, send alerts. Um, our, our progress so far, we're, we're super pumped about chain dollo because uh, we're seeing a pretty huge increase in, in usage. Um, the weekly average is, recent, is currently at uh, 45 requests per second, but that's a 57% um, increase from uh, 40 days ago. And we have four nines in uptime for that same uh, duration as well. Um, we have um, three regions where, where we actually operate our uh, clusters. So we have nine strap nodes in three, three regions. So it's easy for anyone to, to join the Filecoin net network. And uh, for the stats dashboard, we have a 99.8% uptime in 2022. Uh, we would like to get that to uh, three, three nines, but we're super close. Uh, what's next? We have the Filecoin chain snapshot service. It's in its uh, planning phase. And our first milestone is to provide snapshots in S3, which is the current functionality now. Um, and we are also hoping to push on HA and scalable Lotus because we need to ensure that we can keep uh, chain.love up and meeting the, um, the demand. And you know, we, we would really love to actually see this uh, service grow. It's super useful to the whole network. And uh, we have a recent Lotus Build Artifact Improvement Plan. Um, there's a link to it there. You, you can read more, more about it, but the uh, general idea is to increase the build success rate and the uh, usability of Lotus packages and, and images that get uh, built as part of the uh, CI pipeline. And that's, uh, that's all, thank you. Thanks, carrying on with Sentinel. Hey, hey everyone, I'm Hector. Um, Sentinel is another of uh, these teams inside NetOps. And our goal is to guide the success of protocol apps technologies through data monitoring. Um, we're especially focused on, on everything that happens on the Filecoin chain. Um, that involves doing a bit of everything, um, writing software and running it in our infrastructure, doing a bunch of data warehousing, but also doing monitoring and analysis of the Filecoin chain, uh, dashboards, alerting. Our main objectives is that this chain data is complete, is reliable. That means it corresponds to what is actually on chain. That we're able to query that data uh, really fast as soon as it's produced by the chain. And that we can extend those queries for the, for the whole length of the chain, which is when it starts becoming a large amount of data. 
uh, of course, it's not only for us internally, it's also for the community to build upon this. That means that we need to make not only the software, but also the, the data that we extract uh, available for reuse for the community so that they can run their own analysis. And we have to keep all of this running while Filecoin keeps taking great uh, steps and making progress at great pace. This is a very uh, simplified diagram of the um, Falcon data extraction pipeline. Um, we have Lily, which I will speak a little bit more in a moment, which is the application that extracts uh, the data from the chain. We push that into a database, in this case, time scale. And we have an additional data pipeline, which is uh, essentially storing the whole archive of data also on, on S3 packets and making it available through Athena, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems very simple here, but there's a little bit more complexity when you look inside those boxes. Um, one of the applications, the main applications that we, that we write and maintain uh, is Lily. Lily is a wrapped Lotus node that watches the chain and on every epoch, every 30 seconds, when the new tip set happens, extracts everything that happens in it, uh, messages, chain economics, sectors that are, uh, have been committed, uh, deals, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is structured as a structured data into a database. And the idea is that we have this running and following the chain perpetually, but also that we're able to use this to also reprocess a chain or, or extract data from, from previous moments, moments in the chain. That happens when, when, you, when you were not running during a certain time or when you introduced a bug or when someone wants to do something else with the data or when someone wants to process a chain which is not mainnet, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is the diagram of the architecture. I think the thing that we're aiming to move to when we want to scale horizontally and so on. Um, now it is similar, but things are more uh, contained on a single application, a single daemon. The main thing that worries us for Lily is that with FVM and with the growth of the Falcon chain, there will be way more things happening on chain. That will mean way more data to extract. And that extraction needs always to happen within these 30 seconds that the that every epoch takes, because otherwise you're going to be falling behind. Therefore, we need to find ways to parallelize uh, extraction as much as possible so that we can indefinitely uh, scale and being able always to have this fresh data for, for analysis. Um, we've done lots of progress. We're at a very stable moment now. We're able to process the chain in time. Uh, all the data goes into dashboards, into the database. Uh, all the data goes into the archive. And our database and our archives are available to partners that we support uh, and that build their own applications, for example. Starboard has made really nice public stats or public panels with graphs about Filecoin for the community. They make Twitter threads about Filecoin data and so on. And this is all powered by the work that we do in Sentinel. And Steph is going to talk about this one. Hi, I'm Steph. Um, I'm part of the Sentinel team. And um, I'm mostly focused on the data um, ingestion and data analysis side. We want to provide data to everybody in the PL network so that you can make more informed and smarter decisions um, in, in your everyday work. And um, our goal is to build like a data platform that enables anyone um, in the PL network to perform their own analysis so that you wouldn't have to, um, let's say like come to me and um, ask for a query. Like ideally you would be able to do that yourself. Um, so that's kind of like what we're working towards. Um, how are we currently doing it? We're creating um, a source of truth with a pipeline that gathers data from different varied sources. Um, so. It's not actually only chain data, but also um, data from our Airtable CRM, um, Tutor Mentions, um, stuff from Elasticsearch, Prometheus, and even Spoke. And we also enable data uh, warehouses for the entrance group um, and also BI systems so that um, uh, people can use uh, their um, self service tool of choice, whether that's Periscope or uh, Looker or um, Observable. Yeah, so currently there's already a lot of dashboards um, available in Periscope. 
And a uh, data warehouse is such a search if already queryable given like the correct credentials. Um, if, if you want access to it, you can just like ping me and um, we can set something up for you. Um, what's next? Um, we need to automate a lot of existing manual processes. So for example, like our um, archiving operation is actually done it's triggered by the user. Uh, so somebody SSHs into um, an EC2 instance and then runs like a bunch of commands and then the uh, archiving process is um, performed. But ideally this should be in, um, in a pipeline that's triggered with a cron job instead of uh, somebody, uh, instead of a person having to do it. We would like to create a well-defined uh, self-service data roadmap so that hopefully by this year, um, people can uh, ask questions uh, to our data warehouse and get um, answers directly. Awesome. Well, th thanks a lot, NetOps, for the deep dive. Thanks all for everyone who presented and for tuning in this week. We'll be back again in four weeks. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day.